joining us today about talking about the Sami Parliament in Scandinavia is Professor Harry Hobbs of the University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Mr. Jordan Elijah, no, thank you for the invitation. Before we get started on talking about how they operate, how these these parliaments operate, is to, is to discuss, well, I, I've actually had a parliament in the Australian sense, because of course, I believe it's Norway, Sweden and Finland that have these parliaments that operate as a kind of voice, which yeah. is what we're going to look at today. But why are they called parliaments? Do they, are they, do they have like the right to, to, to vote on legislation? You know, how do they operate in the sense of being a parliament or not? Yeah, it's a really good question, because one of the discussion points or debate points in this whole uh, long process on a voice to parliament referendum has been, is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait voice going to be like a third chamber of the Australian parliament? Obviously, I, I know you've done a lot of fact checks on this. The answer is no, it's not going to be a third chamber of parliament. Uh, but then the comparison is, well, what about the Sami parliaments? So if they're parliaments, if they're Indigenous representative bodies that allow the Indigenous peoples of Sweden, Norway and Finland to have a say in laws and policies that affect them, and therefore parliaments, is that something similar there? Or is there some sort of slippage in terminology there? So certainly the, the language of Sami parliament is an English translation. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a sort of an easier way to describe what these bodies are. There was some concern, certainly in Sweden, as, at, when they were developing these bodies initially, that if they call themselves a parliament, does that sort of mean that the Reichstag, the, the parliament, of the, the Swedish parliament, is that limited in some way or does it have that same um, connotation of, of the, the national parliament? So it was a similar debate in, in Sweden uh, as well. Uh, and I'd say what they are, they are representative bodies of the Sami people uh, in, in Sweden, Norway and Finland. And uh, they provide advice to the government and parliament in Sweden on, and Norway and Finland on laws that affect Sami people. So they're not parliaments in the sense that the Australian parliament can vote on legislation and develop bills and policies and that sort of stuff. The Sami parliaments don't have any ability to veto legislation in Sweden or to vote on issues in, in Norway or to do anything to do with the government in, in Finland. They're not a, a chamber of the national parliament. They're a representative body that provides advice and input on decisions that affect Sami people and also has some sort of other functions, but uh, which we can talk about in a moment. But they are no, in no way are they a third chamber of the national parliaments of those countries. Why is there a need in the first place to have these, these parliaments? I know they've been around for a few decades. In fact, they predate Marbo, so definitely more advanced than the Australian system. But uh, in that sense, like why, what brought them about? Yeah, and so the, the first sort of one of these uh, Sami panels came at emerged in Norway in 1989 it was established uh, so that predates Marbo of course but the Swedish one was in 1992 uh, and the Finnish one was a few years later so they kind of built off each other and, and worked off, off each other obviously they, those countries are very similar in, in, in lots of different ways and people in Sweden people in Finland saw what Norway was doing and think we could do the same thing how they emerged in the first place was really through a sustained period of uh, activism by Sami people saying we want a bit greater control over decisions that affect our lives this happened primarily in Norway. There was the Alta River controversy where the Norwegian government was planning to dam a river way up in the top of the Norway. If you look at a map of Norway, right at the top of the north coast of Norway, which is traditional Sami territory. And they wanted to dam this river and it was going to impact a lot of Sami people's traditional livelihoods, affect their homes and their communities. Uh, and so there was a sustained period of international protest led by Sami people in the region to say, please don't do that. You know, we want to talk to the government about different ways to, to do this. If you want to meet your um, energy needs, you know, you don't need to build a hydroelectric dam here, essentially. Very similar to the protests we saw in Australia, particularly in uh, Arnhem Land, the Ongu people, Yakala people, the Bar Conditions to try to say, look, um, please don't just give away our land to mining companies. You know, let's have a conversation about this sort of stuff that happened in the 60s as well. So the Alta River controversy was the sort of the flashpoint. Ultimately, Norway built a dam. So the dam was built and the hydroelectric power is operating there. But the Norwegian government thought that they didn't want to do something like that again. They didn't want to sort of so clearly butt up against Sami interests and Sami voices and be exposed to international condemnation. So they said, we need a way to be able to speak to Sami people, a representative body of Sami people, and have their, their voices and their input on laws and policies feed into the legislative process before we get to this flashpoint. So we don't sort of go ahead and make some decision that turns out that they didn't want it becomes a real big issue for us as us as the government. So they decided, uh, you know, they asked some people basically, how can we do this? What can we do? And the Norwegian Sami came back and said, we would like a voice in our own affairs. So we'd like a, a Sami parliament is what emerged us. Uh, and then Sweden and Finland saw what was going on and they said, we want to do the same thing as well. Because the Sami people are one people, but they just have their, their traditional countries uh, demarcated or, or divided by different uh, states today, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and a bit of Russia as well. So Sami people in Sweden, Sami people in Finland said, well, our, our brothers and sisters in, in Norway have a voice. We would like a voice in our, in our government as well. So that's, that's essentially how they emerge. 
Now, when and, you say and that they're absolutely. one people, are you saying like, like of course we know that there are a great diversity of Aboriginal people and, and Torres Strait Islanders in Australia. Are we looking at it same, same sort of sense, or are they more, uh, more of a, a uniform yeah. group there? Yeah, so there's different dialects, but there's one sort of common language. There are different dialects certainly, but they they consider themselves as one people. They were divided by national borders. Okay. And uh, we, we were talking about this process of them emerging. And um, obviously, as we come to the end of this uh, debate, or maybe not the end in Australia, what what was the process of introducing it like? I think the picture of um, Nordic governance is always of a more uh, consensual and cooperative model, which is not always an accurate picture. What what was the process of bringing them in politically? Uh, what was sort of that that process like in, in comparison to Australia? Yeah, that's a really great uh, question. Uh, I agree. Certainly, the, the the image or the picture we have of of Scandinavia or Nordic governance is more um, consensual in that sense, and there's a, a great tradition of having different significant parts of the community or parts of the different sectoral interests represented in government or the interests influenced and in, in represented governments. So, at one level, it was treated very much as a similar thing like that. As in, you know, we speak, we have trade unions already speak to government, we have businesses already speak to government. Let's ensure that we have indigenous peoples uh, can also speak to government as well. So it was seen in that sense quite um, consistent with the uh, cultural and tradition and, and governance traditions of those countries, uh, particularly Norway. Uh, that's not to say that some people would like to say that their interests or, or they are the same as a trade union. You know, they say, well, we are Indigenous people and we have distinct rights as Indigenous uh, peoples. We're not just a, a, a sectoral interest group. But certainly it was seen from the government level as just a, a, a blind spot that hadn't been considered previously. And they thought, well, now this is a significant interest group in our community and we also need to consider their interests and bring them in to the um, early stages of the legislative and political process, so uh, it was not a um, it was not seen as a radical move in that sense. In those three countries, uh, it was seen as sort of a, a kind of um, extension of what they were doing already, but just expanding a little bit. That's not to say there aren't challenges and there aren't sort of um, disputes over the rights of indigenous peoples in these countries as well. But uh, from a sort of a, a, a more governance focus, it was seen as a natural extension to what they were already doing. And then on that that point of of governance bringing it in, um, you've uh, written in the Australian context on on the importance of entrenchment and and past efforts that haven't gone. To what extent is representation of the Sami a, a constitutional value in these countries as opposed to a statutory one? Yeah, it's it's not in no country uh, is the Sami parliament protected uh, in the constitution. So in each case, it's just legislated. So it's a creature of ordinary legislation. It means sometimes the parliament's powers and functions are changed uh, by the Reichstag, by the national parliament of Sweden, Norway or Finland. Uh, but it does mean that, um, uh, that doesn't mean that it is so limited, I suppose. It just means, or, or so sort of insecure. It, it is sort of a part of the, the political culture, part of the governance culture. It has challenges. It sometimes has um uh, you know there are there are debates about how effective it is, and certainly on the and, and how useful and valuable it is on on the non-indigenous side as well as the indigenous side. But it's sort of got seemingly secure in its foundations, even though it is set up in legislation. Part of that is just because they've been established since 1989, 1992, 1995. So they are you know long-running um, institutional features of government already. Uh, so th that sort of longevity, I think, helps to give it the security that maybe a voice might not have initially or for the first few years. I think it's also important to note that in the Australian context, uh, we have had Indigenous representative bodies before, but they have been abolished after several years. And so that history informs the, the, the desire among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to put this voice in the constitution. That doesn't, that's not to the same extent in, in, in the Scandinavian countries. They haven't had similar bodies like the, like the Sami parliaments that have been abolished. And so there isn't, wasn't as seen as a pressing need to, you know, entrench it or make it sure that it wouldn't be abolished because that just wasn't their same history. That that makes a lot of sense, and, and my understanding, um, and please correct me, is that the, the sort of the way constitutionalism is seen in these countries is very different to the, the Anglo-American Australian context of, um, for example, of judicial review of legislation. It, it, it does seem like it's um, quite a different context constitutionally, despite obviously the common democratic structure. That, that's true, and, and so the judicial review of legislation doesn't really exist in this and what they have is a, a free review. So uh, legislation set up um, or, or bills that have been proposed to be passed by the parliament or introduced by government, they are um, uh, pre-vetted, I suppose, by legal experts to work out whether it would be consistent with the constitution or not. So the, the sort of high courts don't have the same power that the US Supreme Court or the Australian High Court has to you know, annul legislation. It's sort of done at, at an earlier stage. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's probably a really good point there because it's they don't they don't have the Westminster system that we do. They don't have the same value for entrenchment. And even in Westminster system, there's still a good of a variety there because of course we've got a constitution, but New Zealand is more of an unwritten constitution uh, as well. So you're looking at the Waitangi Tribunal operating very differently to how the voice is going to operate and to how the Stami Parliament is going to operate right now. But on that point, I guess what are they? What do these two bodies have in, have in common now? I guess there's no regulatory power or anything like that. Uh, does their departments have the same uh, influence, I guess, on, on policy as, as the voice is meant to have? Do they operate in a similar way in that sense? Yeah, again, this is a, this is a very critical question, right? Do they work? Uh, are they effective? Do Sami people uh, respect them and think that it's worth working through these models? And do, government, do non-Indigenous peoples in government and parliament think that the voice is providing a useful advice that they can inform their own decision? That's the absolute critical point. And in any democracy, the answer is sometimes, right? Sometimes they seem to be effective. Sometimes people think that they're worthwhile, and often they think, "Oh, they're not really working that that that, that uh, as intended." So there's that that challenge. It's like that um, equilibrium, right? It sort of it ebbs and flows a little bit. More broadly, what happens is that uh, there's a little bit differences between Norway on one hand and Sweden and Finland on the other. Uh, the Norwegian model has been strengthened in in recent years, or since 2005, it's been strengthened. So not really that recent, but. What exists now is that uh, there's an obligation on government and statutory authorities to consult with, with the Sami parliaments uh, on matters that will affect Sami people. Uh, this is defined to be quite um, a narrow, so gen generally around their particular cultural cultural interests uh, and in their traditional territory, which is the north of the region. So it's a bit narrow, but there's an obligation to consult. Now, that's that's common across all three parliaments. But what Norway says is they say that the government and these statutory authorities need to explain how that consultation worked or didn't work as in did it inform the ultimate design of the bill did it ultimately inform or change any policy or program or service so did did something happen from this consultation they don't have to do any changes but they just need to say set out in in a piece of paper when the bill goes to parliament what was the result of those consultations uh, so that's kind of a key like transparency mechanism i suppose it's a bit of an accountability mechanism it doesn't it doesn't mandate change and again parliament is the ultimate authority about what it wants to do but it just shows the rest of the country whether the voice was successful in sort of having its views taken into account. And that's not quite the same in Sweden and, and Finland, but generally speaking, that this, you know, there is a position about whether the voice was effective or not. Now, the powers of the parliament are, are similar to what we expect the voice would be, the powers of the Sami parliament, sorry. Those powers are basically to inform and advise the government on laws that affect Sami interests or affect Sami culture directly. Um, it's a little bit different in, in the Nordic countries because Sami territories in the north of the country doesn't exist across the whole of the continent or across the whole of the territory of the countries like it does in Australia. So it's generally in the northern areas. Um, but there are similar concerns around mining, around exploitation of, of mineral resources, around increasing urbanisation. And so these, these factors obviously affect uh, Sami culture and Sami land interests particularly. Uh, and so this is something that the Sami people, the Sami parliaments discuss uh, most significantly things around fishing rights, things around reindeer husbandry rights. Uh, global warming is a big issue as well because it means that it's harder for, you know, there's a lower carrying capacity of reindeer for the different uh, the stock. And so that affects Sami culture particularly and Sami industry particularly. So the parliaments really speak to parliament, the, the Sami parliaments speak to their governments about these issues primarily. That's what the voice would do in Australia. The Sami parliaments have an additional responsibility which the voice will not have in Australia. And that's a program or service delivery function. So this is a bit like what ATSIC had uh, a number of years previously, the most recent large-scale national Indigenous representative body that could speak directly to government. What the Sami parliaments do is they also um, provide funding and provide services for Sami people uh, on particular issues, namely around reindeer husbandry, importantly, but also around education, in, you know, in, in ensuring the Sami language is re revitalised and developed and, and understood by children in, in Sami areas. Uh, and they kind of funnel most of that program and service delivery function through the Sami parliaments rather than through the Norwegian or Swedish government. Now, the voice won't have a program of service delivery function. It will only be a representative body in Australia. So it only have that first function of what the Sami parliaments do, which is advise government and advise parliament. And and how has the reaction been? Obviously, it's, um, I'm sure, a diverse group of people. But on the whole, do, do the Sami feel satisfied with the system? Do they feel heard? What what do they think about how it's been able to to get their voice heard? Yeah, I think there's a um, there's a division, right? Like any group of people will have different opinion about uh, whether things are effective or not. Some people will, if you speak to some Sami people who who I've done part of my research, they say that um, this is an effective, you know, pragmatic institution that ensures that their interests are heard. Others might say, well, 
it's sort of institutionalizing Sami rights and Sami discourse through the state. And they say they might want to say they want to be a bit more critical of it and say that the state kind of um, uh, takes over control a little bit of what Sami interests are and helps to shape it a bit. And, and maybe the people involved in this are uh, kind of, you know, I don't want to use the words, but they would say words like sellouts as, as such. And so there's that division between more critical th- uh, voices and people who are more pragmatic, perhaps, who are happy with uh, ensuring that, you know, um, that things are working from time to time. Look, it doesn't always, they don't always get their way. You know, as I said, through any democracy, you don't always get your way. When you're a small group of the population and the Sami people are, are even smaller proportionally than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, so they're about 1% of the population, it's, it's obviously not, not feasible that you always get your, your wishes in any democracy. But certainly those that work through the system and are happy with the parliament generally think that it works better for them than the alternative. So there is that concern. There's also, you know, even though the Sami are one people, there are schisms that run through the community as well, right? And, and so there are divisions between people who primarily engage in reindeer husbandry for, as, as an occupation and others who don't do, engage in reindeer husbandry. Uh, and so the Swedish Sami parliament, for example, has, has been riven by this division for many, many years. The division was implemented by kind of this, the practices of colonisation, but it just has meant that there's this schism that exists that means sometimes the parliament doesn't work as effectively because it can't speak in one uniform voice. You know, it, has, it has differences of opinions. Um, and the government might say, "Well, we don't really know who we who we should, sorry, who we should listen to, or how we should engage with this advice because there, there are different levels of advice." And and on sort of more objective measures, um, and I think this is the the kind of context we think about in Australia with with just some really dreadful objective measures for um, how so many Indigenous people are faring. Have have the has the sort of objective lot of the semi people been improving since these bodies were brought in? So people on the ground talking about this would say overall, yes, this, the outcomes are getting better. Uh, the situation is a little bit different. It's not to the same extent the the disadvantage in Sami communities like it is a relative disadvantage as it is in many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Australia. The the measures are a little bit hard sometimes to assess because following um, World War II, uh, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, the Scandinavian countries and Nordic countries decided that they do not want to keep records of uh, minority groups and minority populations because they saw what happened with record keeping on that front. So the overall numbers of Sami people is a little bit undetermined in these countries and therefore it's a bit hard to always um, uh, be clear about uh, relative levels of socioeconomic development in different communities because again there's the numbers are, are uncertain or unclear um, for very valuable you know, for very valid valid reasons. But generally speaking um, you know my analysis and this, talking to uh, people involved in the parliaments and over in, in Scandinavia, they seem to say that basically overall, um, you don't get everything, but things improve. Obviously, the mention that Australian uh, politics has that um, Nordic politics known as federalism, but I'm curious, given sort of uh, regional or local governments, are are those sort of lower levels of government responding and engaging with these bodies? Yeah, and again, it's sort of not always. Politics change, right? And so different parties come into power at different times who might be more or, or less sympathetic or inclined to um, support the aspirations of the Sami parliaments. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, these countries do, aren't federations, right? So they don't have um, separate separate state or provincial governments, They've got, but they do have a d- devolved administration. So there are regional levels of government and, and local governments in, in, in Sweden, Norway, and Finland as well. Uh, the Sami parliaments have a right to speak to these bodies as well. Uh, and so they, the statutory authorities at, at, at the other levels, at lower levels, do need to speak to the parliaments when they want to engage or want to involve, uh, do things that relate to Sami uh, people's culture, interests, etc. Uh, often that means that the Sami parliaments feel overwhelmed, right? They get they get a lot of requests to engage and, and speak on certain matters, and they say, "Look, we, you know, we are part time representatives. We do not have a full time salary. The only people who work full time is the president, and the vice president is on a part time wage." everybody else does this uh, in their own time, right? Because they still have to have their own jobs. And so they feel overwhelmed by the by the amount of um, materials that they're consulted from. So sometimes there is that challenge where governments might say, yeah, we want to consult, we want to engage, but the parliament say, look, we are, we are overwhelmed, we, we can't do that. And so they need to um, husband, I guess, their resources and work out what they want to focus on and their priorities. Uh, but it's an ongoing challenge where they say, look, we need more administrative support, uh, more secretarial support, uh, more funding in different cases to engage with you when you want to speak to us. Now, well, you're talking a bit about political divides there. Of course, you mentioned the the reindeer husbandry divide and things like that, and also being affected by by politics. Would there be a similar division uh, in Scandinavia over over you know different parties? And because, of course, they don't have any entrenchment there. I know one debate we've got in Australia, of course, is you know whether or not 
the Liberals or the Labour would change legislation as parties change who can form government. Do we have the similar sort of thing in Scandinavia or is it a bit more set in stone as as a as a, as a, as a principle rather than, of course, as legislation? But is it is there more of a willingness to keep things the same? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I would say, uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, politics is changing uh, quite dramatically in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, you know, the, the sort of the traditional picture of a fairly stable um, sort of um, centre-left party has, has, has dropped a lot and, and there's just a lot more competition in these proportional systems of government. So things change quite radically and, and quite dramatically. I would say, generally speaking, that at one level, uh, on, on more on the left uh, of politics, there's a desire to kind of, increase the parliament's powers to some degree to ensure kind of get similar to what Norway has done to say that there should be an obligation to consult and then that sort of obligation the consultation process should be set down in stone and written and explained and how it worked obviously not a veto and no any determinative vote or factor they kind of just be clear about what's going on uh, and on the right side of politics there is less there's less desire for that and there's probably more desire to marginalize the parliaments to some degree uh, in favor of other interests in in in, in Sutney, which is the traditional territory so that is true. I haven't seen anyone that said that they would abolish the Sami parliaments. Um, so we're not at that stage. Uh, but certainly there is sort of the tinkering around the edges um, and the ebbs and flows, I guess, changes depends on which party's in power. And then again, how much political capital you want to spend on uh, on this issue, which again only affects a small minority of voters in, in, in each country. And so it's sort of maybe less significant for a, a party who's been elected to, to spend capital on this particular issue, for, you know, just for base democratic political reasons. The other thing I should say is that only the Norwegian parliament has um, uh, national political parties that, that stand in the Sami parliament. So there is a, you know, a, a Labour Party candidate stand in the Norwegian Sami parliament, whereas the Swedish and Finnish uh, parliaments have don't have Labour liberal equivalent parties that stand. They have Sami parties. And, and so they uh, um, you know represent distinct Sami interests and there are a number of political parties that stand and get elected to the positions. But they don't have, a, they're not mainstream parties, if that makes sense. So it's only the Norwegian parliament where mainstream parties also stand in the parliament. What, why do you think it is that um, there has been such a reluctance to look at this kind of comparative evidence? And that's what we're all about at this uh, between Parks Place and Capitol Hill. And, and what do you think for the future we can learn about trying to compare the Australian situation to all these different examples around the world for? having, I, I guess, a better idea rather than sort of staring at this black box because Australia has never tried this before? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's um, it's it's been interesting watching the debate um, unfold. I think the focus really has been because we haven't had referendums very often in this country. You know, I, I imagine Stuart hasn't voted in a referendum before. Uh, no. I, haven't voted, I haven't voted in a referendum either. Uh, I think a lot of Australians don't know what a referendum is and they don't really know. And then the next thing is, well, what is the constitution? And so I think it's very hard to first step, you know, to explain that there is a constitution, uh, explain what's in it, explain why it's not working very well for one group of Australians and explain then why they want to change it and why we should change it. So there are a number of logical steps you have to take there that people can drop in and out of because they kind of are busy and maybe not interested or maybe just aren't, happen to, aren't aware of this issue before. So I think a lot of the focus of the campaign has been doing those things earlier. There's been a bit of stuff about trying to say that this is not a, a, a radical proposition. And I think comparative examples around the world show that it isn't a radical proposition. Uh, it is not, um, I wouldn't say it's widespread, but it's certainly not uh, unique. You know? And there are a number of countries that around the world have done similar things. They work uh, at times. They don't work as effectively at other times, like any democratic body full of people, right? Things sometimes help, some work, sometimes don't. Um, but I think it has been interesting that there hasn't really been much discussion about comparative examples to show that this is not a scary proposition. Uh, the focus really has been on just the, you know, just the, I think that, um, and I, I suppose to some degree that's because the Uber statement is is calling for an Australian solution to an Australian problem is the way they frame it, I suppose, which is a an idea that this is a unique issue for Australia, that we don't have a way to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I think the comparative examples show that it's not a unique Australian problem, uh, but certainly the Australian solution will be unique. And it's helpful to learn from other countries to see what they have done to, to resolve or an attempt to resolve with their own unique challenges and, and see what we can learn from Australia. So I think comparative example is really good, uh, but it just hasn't really been that prominent in, in debate uh, for whatever reason. I, I can't explain why, really. Well, well I think it's probably a, an excellent place to wrap this up. Thank you once again for joining us, uh, Professor Harry Hobbs of University of Technology, Sydney. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Elijah. Really happy to be here.